Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome along to the very first Landlord Lens of 2022. This is the collaboration between Property Tribes, of which I am the co-founder, and I'm also a full-time residential landlord myself, and uh, the NRLA. And as always, uh, for this Landlord Lens uh, discussion, I'm joined by uh, NRLA CEO Ben Beadle. Ben, Happy New Year to you. It feels weird to be saying Happy New Year on the 1st of February, my darling, but Happy New Year to you and to our listeners. <laughs> Indeed. Happy New Year to everybody watching. We may have some newbies joining us. And if so, um, you know, first timers on this, this webinar, you're very welcome. Very quickly, uh, what Ben and I do is we look at the trending topics on property tribes. Uh, and this is landlord discussions that are sorted according to popularity, level of engagement and so on. Um, so Ben and I have a look at them literally just before the webinar, and then we choose which ones we're going to bring into uh, the call to discuss, because it's very interesting, Ben, isn't it, to, to see where landlord uh, positivity is, where landlord negativity is. Um, and these trending topics really are just like a barometer of, of how landlords are feeling about the sector. That's right, Vanessa. I think it's really helpful, certainly as an association, to make sure that uh, you know we're in tune with what the uh, the wider landlord audience uh, is thinking uh, and what they're doing going about their daily business, because it means we can support them better. It's as simple as that. Indeed. Well, today, um, you know, we're just at the beginning of, of 2022, and it's absolutely incredible how this year uh, for the property sector has come out of the trap. Um, all the indicators are up. Now, they're not all good indicators, but these are some of the ones that I wanted to highlight. House prices up, rents up, inflation up, base rate up, tenant demand up first time landlord mortgage searches up, number of buy to let mortgage products up, uh, property event attendance up. Uh, ben, it is absolutely incredible the level of activity uh, in our sector <clears throat> so early into the year. I mean, it, it's hard to hard to comprehend, don't you think? It, it is, but you know, as we've said on this webinar before, Vanessa, it shows the importance of our sector uh, to the wider economy uh, is often touted as being sort of a you know a, a, a barometer if you will of of sort of wider confidence and despite you know soaring inflation and what looks to be a, another uh, interest rate rise uh, in the offing later this week uh, we are still seeing newbie investors coming into the market and that's that's great um you know we we talk and will no doubt talk about some things that are going to affect, affect long or hopefully not infect uh, uh, affect lo uh, long longer term investors that have been there seen it you know done it got the t-shirt and are feeling a bit downcast about the direction of travel uh but you know there's a a, a new breed of landlords that are joining the NRLA as well that uh uh I guess are getting their head around regulation and getting their head about around some of the things that are in store, which is uh, interesting to see. Well, it's always, uh, you know, whenever there is an inflation rise, people often turn their sights to property mm. as a hedge against inflation. So it's, it's, I don't know, it's so often a double edged sword in property. property. Sometimes, you know, it can be uh, a negative thing, but then it can actually end up being a positive thing as well. I'm, what I'm trying to say, Ben, I think there's always a, a kind of silver lining to every dark cloud. And uh, obviously, uh, normal inflation is, is going to impact on, on house price inflation and, and push prices up. So lots of things for landlords, lots of indicators for landlords to be looking at and considering when, when making their business decisions in 2022. Um, tomorrow, uh, there's going to be a, a, a very significant announcement by uh, Michael Gove. And we're kind of almost preempting what I think is going to become a, a trending topic. We're that far ahead of the curve, Ben. Um, so tomorrow uh, we've heard reports that there is going to be an announcement by the government. Um, there is some talk of some form of um, national landlord register and also landlords uh, having to be a member of an in independent redress scheme. Uh, I'm curious about this announcement, Ben. Is it part of the renters reform bill or is it something kind of new uh, that, that the government is going to announce tomorrow? Well, um, uh, 
the government have already given us a, an idea of what's going to be in it, as you know, Vanessa, they've leaked it to the Times. It was in the Times yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and today we see announcements about uh, education. Uh, so they're clearly giving us uh, a preca- uh, 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 an advanced view as to what's going to be in this paper. This paper is the levelling up paper. This is the paper that's going to cure all of our woes and, uh, you know, bridge the gap between the uh, the inequality that exists uh, uh, across the United Kingdom. Uh, so we will still see a renters reform bill. But the reality is uh, that I think this will be a couple of paragraphs for the private rented sector. Um, and in keeping with the green agenda, it will be recycling stuff that they've already announced uh, because I don't think there are uh, uh, terribly significantly uh, significant plans uh, afoot. Uh, The government have been uh, partying wildly, uh, 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 laughing in our faces, and uh, I don't think they've had a great deal of time to come up with uh, innovative new uh, suggestions. So what I'm expecting to see uh, tomorrow uh, is, um, let me get my form of words right, Uh, a commitment to explore a landlord registration scheme. Uh, So uh, lots of noise today about a landlord registration scheme. Um, And I'm sure that something like this will be part of the the white paper. And as we've discussed in this forum, I'm ambivalent about a landlord registration scheme. It will do NAFL uh, to uh, cure the problems that exist in this sector. Uh, And the reality is, and I told this to the uh, select committee yesterday, um, if you are going to bring in landlord redress, which I think everybody accepts is a a sensible step given that it exists for agents, um, uh, and you get landlords to sign up to that scheme, uh, haven't you got to register anyway? Um, uh, So I I think government could be a bit smarter about this uh, because... For me, landlords signing up to a, a, a redress scheme just bridges a gap that exists in the sector. Um, as somebody that doesn't use an agent that uses that, that, that finds tenants them, themselves, then why should there be a two tier system between if you rent through an agent or you rent through a landlord? So I'm excited about landlord redress. We'll be announcing some exciting plans as the NRLA over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, uh, to put members' minds at rest in relation to redress. I won't say any more than that at the moment. Um, uh, so th- that will be in the paper, but uh, that was in the Queen's speech two years ago, mm-hmm. uh, and they still haven't done it. Uh, the other thing uh, that will be also referenced is the removal of Section 21. Um, you know, I hate to uh, sound like Groundhog Day here, but the government like to give the impression that they're doing something on this. The reality is that they haven't done a great deal because of the COVID response, quite understandably. But um, uh, this, all, although it, it, it's referenced in the levelling up paper, the reality is it will be part of the renters reform bill, uh, of which... Uh, uh, Eddie Hughes is still consulting. There are still roundtables going on. The next one is on the 8th of February. So, yes, we will get an announcement tomorrow. I'm, I, I'm hopeful that there'll be more exciting things uh, in that paper uh, than the references to housing. But, uh, um, yeah, the, the devil is always in the detail. So we'll we're, we're, we're wait and see. We will indeed. Well, let's move on to our first kind of trending topic pick. Uh, And this is a thread called Everything This Government Does Fires Up By To Let. And this was started by myself uh, a few weeks ago. And I just reached the conclusion that everything that the government has done, probably for the last five or six years, has actually just done the exact opposite to what they wanted because they wanted to curb buy to let investment uh, and unfortunately well whatever however you look at it it's not it's not worked um, i'm talking about things like um you know increasing regulation and legislation you know increasing taxation uh removal of section 21 all of these things have caused landlords to leave the sector uh which has put uh you know pressure on on rents going up uh obviously they haven't built enough social housing um and and i don't know what you think ben but it seems to me that that they tweak all these different levers and they they don't understand or don't realize the co- the kind of collateral damage that, that that might cause and it's very very frustrating that no 
um, housing minister or government seems to have <clears throat> fully understood the complexity and how if you tweak a lever here, it does something over here. It's kind of like the butterfly effect, isn't it? Yeah, it's the whack-a-mole approach to, to politics. You think you sorted sorted one thing out and two bloody other moles pop up over here. Um, and I think this was something that I, I was giving evidence about yesterday. So this was in light of the National Audit Office report that was done just before Christmas that, that basically said they acknowledged that the government had taken a number of steps, but it really sort of lacked a, a serious long-term strategy mm. for what the private rented sector is, is here to do. And as a consequence, what we see is you know, well-meaning pieces of regulation that's brought in, um, but no assessment of that legislation as to whether it's been effective or, or or serve the desired purpose so we simply you know run from one mole to to, to another whacking it and 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 believing that's going to solve the issue and then you know it becomes sort of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy of um of, of greater regulation and that's why the nrla has been shining a light on the amount of regulation that the landlord uh, community has to deal with uh we believe it's in the region of about 160 uh, pieces of, of legislation that, that landlords need to be complying with. And, and yet, you know, we still have a sector that we're not happy with. Um, we think that, uh, you know, it's, it's delivering unsafe homes and homes that aren't fit for purpose. The, the issue for us is that this is not an unregulated sector. You know, I wouldn't want people thinking it's the Wild West. Yet we bring in this regulation without any thought process as to how it's going to be enforced or to how it's going to be policed and as a consequence uh you know uh, we have local authorities that are on the bones of their backside um that have had their funding uh, heavily cut and so you know all, all of the good guys uh, like those listening uh to this webinar will dutifully comply with whatever government throws at them until they uh, until they form a view that it's not worth it. And then those that have no intention of complying and sort of operate in the, you know, the back streets of the, the underworld of the, uh, of the private rented sector um, that looks after some of the most vulnerable people in our society, get away with it time and time again. And I think that um, the government uh, have been called out on this now. There was a lengthy discussion for those that are interested in this uh, with the, um, uh, I forget the, the, the guy's name now uh, that I was on the panel with, but basically the director general and the one above her uh, at, uh, at the levelling up, Jeremy Pock Pocklington, very, very senior civil servants that are responsible for this. And they were being held to account by the um, uh, Public Accounts Committee yesterday about some of the issues in the sector. Uh, uh, but this is a case of being careful what we what we wish for, because, uh, you know, if, if they are going to bring around meaningful um, uh, long term uh, reform of our sector, you know, it could still be painful. Uh, so we just have to, you know, balance our calls very, very carefully, I think. Mm. I agree. Well, let's move on to our, our second trending topic. And it's interesting that you just mentioned, Ben, that some landlords that have been in the game for a long time, something will come along that is just the straw that broke the camel's back. And they think, actually, I've, I've had enough. Uh, they, they may bring forward their plans to, to exit more quickly as a result uh, of, of this kind of feeling. I, I have to confess, I, I have felt it myself a couple of times. Um, but it's very interesting because our second trending topic is a UK large landlord on why he is selling up. And this was based around an article uh, where uh, an, an unnamed uh, portfolio landlord said that he was selling up because of the forthcoming removal of Section 21. And to use his words, it scares the hell out of me. And that was the final straw for him. He didn't want to be in a sector where he couldn't or felt that he was unlikely to be able to get control of his, of, of his investment properties. So very interesting that I felt I was quite surprised that it was that straw that kind of broke his back. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree, um, uh, to be honest with you. I am slightly more relaxed about Section 21 going than 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 some others, to be frank. And I see there's a, um, a question in the chat about, uh, let me just have a quick look, about uh, whether there's any chance of retaining uh, Section 21. And I don't think there is, um, to be honest with you. I think for me, uh, a, a couple of things, you know, a lot of landlords say to me that, that they don't evict a tenant without a reason, <laughs> that there is a reason for, uh, you know, for, of course there is, you know, it's a really curious business model that when you get somebody in your property that you would suddenly think about, you know, evicting a good uh, a yeah. tenant that's paying, you know, so, and I made that argument quite powerfully at the, at the select committee yesterday, which I think is understood. Um, but the, the, the issue is that there are still some landlords out there who will seek to, uh, use section 21 in a way that you know maybe uh, has become old hat you, you know a, a way of managing rent increases a, a way of managing not repairing your property you know all things that are alien to us as decent landlords but stuff that goes on out there so so for me I don't think there is a chance of retaining section 21 um, we would frankly be weeing in the wind excuse my french um if we were to come out uh, uh, and and uh and, and and offer a contrary view and that's why it, we've spent a lot of time uh, and i managed to get this agreement yesterday at the select committee uh, that this is about enhancing section eight and i was very pleased to see um my counterpart from shelter agree with me that they accepted that landlords needed a greater range of uh, 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 mandatory and non-mandatory grounds for obtaining their possession back. That was a helpful, helpful intervention. Because the point that I was making is that Section 21 is a very easy way uh, of being able to get your property back granted. But when it is gone, we need to make sure that for legitimate reasons like arrears and antisocial behaviour and all of the things that uh, uh, not letting you in for a gas certificate, a bit putting you in breach of your own legal obligations, etc., etc. We need new grounds that reflect the things that Section 21 masks. And I've had uh, very detailed conversations with very senior civil servants and the minister on this issue. And uh, they come as a pair or they go as a pair. So Section 21 goes and a, a, a reform Section 8 uh, that is speedier and uh, more uh, user friendly for those uh, with legitimate reasons for using it uh, comes in. Uh, and that's to me is, is why I'm not worrying too much about it, because we have the answers and I think that we can influence the agenda to make sure that that's what happens. Yes, it's interesting because landlords do <clears throat> need to have confidence that they can get their properties back, but so do lenders. Um, you know, that's very key to buy to let lending. Uh, it's interesting, Ben, because one of the narratives that the, 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 the tenant charities like Shelter and some of the tenant unions spin is they, they say that Section 21 is one of the biggest causes of homelessness. Uh, and I can understand to in some ways why they say that because if somebody has to leave their home there are costs involved in moving there might be costs in raising a new deposit etc some people might not be able to afford that for whatever reason people end up sofa surfing then they they lose their residential address and then things can go down downhill can. rapidly and i can understand that and what i'm campaigning for or what i'm trying to create awareness for at the moment uh, and going forwards into 2022 is the benefits of selling a, a tenanted property or indeed a tenanted portfolio uh, because obviously the tenancy just moves to the new landlord um, and there are benefits for, for all of the parties in the transaction. The landlord that's selling earns rental income up to the, uh, the day of completion. The landlord that's buying uh, earns rental income from day one of completion. They can check the payment history of the tenant. They can check how the tenant's keeping the property and, they, uh, and the tenant benefits because they retain their tenancy and remain in, in that particular property. And I think there needs to be more awareness of selling tenanted properties and portfolios but when you go to a high street agent they always say oh no you, you've got to have vacant possession mm. where, where do you think this comes from because if we look at the stats which i have done in the last week uh there's a there's very very little difference now between 
the price achieved for vacant possession and the, tr the price achieved for a tenanted property, taking a into account if you had voids while you were waiting to complete a sale on a vacant property? I, I mean, I would see this as just sort of apathy uh, on, on the agent's part, because I agree with you, Vanessa. I, I've actually bought and sold uh, tenanted property and done right. It's, you know, why wouldn't you want to do it? You know, you don't cause disruption to people that are living there and you get rent up until the day of completion uh, or rent from the day of completion depending on what your situation is so so to me it, it, it it's really just you know not not copying and pasting what you've done for the last 10 15 years i think there's a lot to be obviously if you find a buyer that is a first time buyer that wants to move in that might give rise to giving uh you know to giving a notice um uh, but i think there's a lot to be said in this environment for people moving their portfolios amongst landlords and it's certainly something we're exploring at the nrla about you know an appropriate partner uh, to do that to do that work with but you raised the point about you know um uh tenant groups sort of giving out that uh, section 21 is the biggest cause of homelessness uh, and it, it is maybe uh, but you know in a few years time it'll be section eight uh, you know uh, we have to look beyond the reasons you know landlords have a right to get their property back section 21 is simply the vehicle within which to do it now i get that it's become a politically toxic debate but we've been asked on in one of the chats um yeah what would be what would we what would the alternative to section 21 be if i can get my teeth in and it would be enhanced grounds under section 8 accompanied by um uh, a speedier court process uh, uh i hope uh for non responding uh, tenant so yeah, I, I kind of think that argument's a little bit weak uh on on the tenant groups i mean i don't get too excited about it but um you know it, it it's just a way that landlords get their property back um and you know in a few years time it'd be section eight what we have to you know if we're if we're that worried about you know people leaving the private rented sector or their home or their rented home whatever sector it's in and not being able to get alternative accommodation then we need to look at you know the things around this we don't just go after the things that are are are, are causing it in in their view you know we have a, a dearth of supply in our sector uh, across all tenures and across all income groups you know we need more homes in every sector yeah. um we also need to make sure that things like uh, if you if you have a tenant on benefit uh benefits uh, claiming universal credit we need to make sure that universal credit uh, uh, you know, is increased in the right way. At the moment, it's frozen in cash terms. So uh, as years go on, you're going to get even more out of kilter, um, particularly as we recover from the pandemic. We need to make sure that, you know, we've got a vibrant economy, that jobs are available and the welfare net properly supports those that need it. Yes, it's interesting. I think um, I think some of the things that the NR NRLA has, has suggested in the past were things like uh, a capital gains tax, uh, less capital gains tax if you sell sold to your tenant, uh, maybe less capital gains tax if you sell to another landlord with the tenant in situ. I think there are incentives to encourage landlords uh, to, you know, to encourage landlords to sell tenanted properties so they remit, the tenant can remain in their home and the property remains in the, the sector. But um, I think there's also a great deal of education to do around this topic uh, and some myths kind of bust about it. Uh, yeah. And I'm really pleased to hear that the NRLA is, is, is looking into this issue. Um, we'll move on to uh, our third topic. And uh, just to say before we do, uh, thank you to everybody that's dropping questions in the Q&A box. It's open for questions. Ben's just had a little look at some of them uh, as we've been gone through. Um, Yes, there's Nick is saying, Nick Cross is saying the problem with statistics used to show S21 increases homelessness is centered around how the uh, sector is hard is asked to, the local authority is asked how to record the reason uh, for these approaches or homelessness. Um, and yeah, you've just got this blanket thing service mm, section 21. Um, so it's a conflated issue as to how the tenancy ends um, are recorded by local authorities and they don't make any distinctions why the section 21 was served. So he, uh, Nick is actually making a very good suggestion there that uh, local authorities should be able to uh, uh, 
record the data differently and, and make distinctions of um, reasons why a tenancy was ended. I think that's a very good idea because data, goodness me, it's so important uh, in our, well, in every sector because it gives you insights um, and the more you collect, the deeper insights you have. Let's move on to our third topic uh, now. This was an interesting discussion, uh, still ongoing, still trending. Would you increase the rent after 15 years? Mm. And this was started by a Property Tribes member who has um, a landlord friend who has very significant other income. And this landlord friend has not increased the rents for 15 years just because he doesn't need the money, essentially, which is a very nice position to be in. But, um, you know, it is interesting for landlords who are not in such a fortunate position, um, how how long do you run without increasing the rent? If you've got a good tenant in there that's looking after the property, paying the rent on time, you know, I, I've got tenants, I think my longest standing tenants about eight years now. Um, my personal approach, Ben, is I wait till the tenancy ends uh and and then i think at, i look at the the local market and see if there's any possibility of increasing the rent slightly um but over these very long time frames uh what's what's your view on this my my view is don't try and bring it up to market rent now <laughs> you know um uh if you if you're going to increase the rent then it's far and I'm, I, I should say I'm a total hypocrite for this because I, I'm not far off this example with, with a couple of my tenants in terms of number of years. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I'm literally the, the person that says, do as I say, not as I do. But with that, with that caveat, the, 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 the issue that those tenants will have is all, is all of a sudden if you try and bring it up to market rent. And I have no idea what the starting point is or the, or, or the, the current value is. But you want to obviously avoid that increase being a significant increase, you know, a couple of hundred quid a month or whatever. Actually, the best thing to do uh, uh, with my caveat caveat of being a total hypocrite accepted is that we really should be increasing the rents um you know uh, annually uh, in line with uh, things like believe it or not you know inflation and uh, and other types of measures now it's probably a good job that um landlords are pretty lax and it's one of the 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 areas that comes up time and time again it, uh, if you rent through a private landlord uh, versus an agent you know, landlords are pretty poor at raising the rent, but what they have a tendency to do is say, oh, good, I haven't put the rent up for 10 years. I'm I'm now £500 a month down and I need to put my rent up. And actually, if you don't pay, I'm going to give you a Section 21 notice. You know, this comes back into that whole stereotype about Section 21 and the the the, the, the wrong things, uh, or, you know, the um, it being executed poorly. So generally, I'd say you'd be looking for a, a, a cost of living increase uh, annually a small amount and detailed in the contract that says you know after a period of time we'll look to raise the rent no more than x percent uh, but i get that it's difficult to do and i like you vanessa uh, have, have generally formed the view that uh, a tenant that's paying and looking after the property is worth more to me than you know a 20 20 quid a month uh, uplift e each to your own but it's one of the reasons why um you know it, we can get ourselves in a in a pickle as we try to catch up so my advice is don't try and catch it up i also think that um you know if you you do increase the rent let's say by 20 30 pounds a month and then you have a void that that's wiped out <laughs> the 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 rent increase going forward if you see what i mean so uh it's i think it's good to judge each individual situation on its own merits um and i think a lot of landlords are very busy in their workaday worlds many of us have other things going on kids cats dogs holidays work careers professions etc uh and we don't really keep that up to date with with the market and sometimes I, i'm speaking for myself here sometimes i've gone and you know about a year later i've gone and looked just out of interest on right move to see what rents are in mm -hmm. a certain area for my type of property and i've seen there's been a very significant increase and oh i've gone oh that's quite surprising um i think it's quite interesting to to say that 
I feel in a way I have actually been stung by one particular tenant because I didn't raise the rent for a long time. And this is a, a one bed flat in Edmonton in North London. And I'd had a tenant there for a very, very long time. And he'd been generally a good tenant. He, uh, I, I hadn't raised the rent at all. He disappeared off to, to, to Canada to stay with a relative. I don't know what's happened to him, to be honest. But um, the rent to me was 900 pounds a month. He then sublet my flat to somebody else for £1,300 a month. So I don't know whether the low rent he was, uh, you know, taking in or he was paying was encouraging him to actually try to sublet and, and make a little bit of a margin off it. And, oh dear, what a mess. I eventually mm. found out that this subtenant was living there. The state of the property was, it was very poor. Um, we couldn't get access. We couldn't get hold of the, 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 the original tenant. It's been an absolute nightmare to sort it all out. So, uh, you know, just a little thought there that if you are too nice, uh, too altruistic, some people maybe can take advantage of it. So worth worth bearing in mind, don't you think? I agree. Totally agree with that, Vanessa. Goody. OK, um, we're moving on to our final topic now. Uh, and uh, this one is called Farewell, Mr. Dinner Party landlord and this was an article that was being discussed on property tribes which a member saw on a uh, mortgage introducer and this was basically saying uh that the the noughties landlord is becoming as rare as a prawn cocktail starter i like that little turn of phrase it's good mind you i had a prawn cocktail starter <laughs> a couple of weeks ago <laughs> um and that this dinner party landlord that we that everybody used to talk about uh is becoming extinct due to tax uh, changes, increasing legislation, and landlords professionalizing their businesses through limited companies. And of course, one of those up statistics we've had just in the last couple of weeks is uh, the amount of limited companies for landlords um, has gone through the roof. I think it was 47,000 uh, new company registrations for landlords in 2000 you know, in uh, 2021. So, um, Ben, uh, you know, this is a kind of uh, well-known character, Mr. Dinner Party Landlord. Um, is, is, he, is he really dying out? Is the sector becoming professionalised? Because in some ways, if it is, that, that's a good thing. Yeah, I, I mean, look, Mr. Dinner Party Landlord is reinventing himself, isn't he? Or she, uh, you know, uh, and I say well done to them. You know, if there's a, a way around these punitive tax changes, then uh, fill your boots, frankly. Um, uh, so I see no issue with that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not too too worried about uh, that that sort of perception. You know, it, it, things have been done to professionalise the sector. If if landlords are getting on on board and getting on with their lives and still deriving the uh, the returns, whether they do it as an individual, whether they do it through a shell company, just shows that you know that section what a nonsense section twenty four is. You know that 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 landlord is still there. They may well have it through a, a slightly different entity rather than uh, in individually, but. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really, uh, I'm not fixated on this at all. I think more generally, I would like to see a, a more appropriate fiscal framework within which um, uh, property owners can invest and uh, increase the supply of, uh, of, of homes. But I'm afraid, folks, uh, that is not now. Uh, it is not the right time to be going cap in hand uh, uh, to uh, Rishi or, or others. Uh, uh, to grow the sector. Um, that said, I did get, uh, so um, next month, I think our magazine comes out and we have uh, the, well, hopefully he'll be the housing minister uh, by then, uh, but Chris Pincher uh, has written uh, an article for us um, about the role of individual landlords, the contribution that they make and the importance to the sector. And I think uh, without giving too much away, um, it's, it, it's nice to hear. <laughs> um, uh, as I remind Chris on frequent occasion, you've got a funny way of showing it sometimes. Uh, but but this is this is politics. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the dinner party uh, landlord uh, may well have morphed into something else, but I suspect they're still a dinner party landlord at heart. Yeah, well, I, I think, Ben, that the, the fundamentals underpinning buy to let and the UK property market 
they, they haven't really changed from when I started. Uh, to be truthful, I was started out as a dinner party landlord in 1992 when I couldn't sell um, my flat in London because I had a defective lease. So I rented it out and I bought another flat uh, two miles down the road, a bigger, bigger apartment. Um, and, you know, it, it is interesting that these fundamentals, even when I started, that they actually haven't changed. There's many, many reasons to invest in property uh, and to take advantage of, of leveraged buy to let, uh, because that's still, you know, a really, really strong uh, financial instrument to use. Um, I think what we've seen, what we, we may see, Ben, is we, I don't think we'll see landlords growing their portfolios as quickly. Uh, the days of these really massive portfolio landlords who, you know, had hundreds, 600 properties when, uh, you know, it was easy go-go money mm -hmm. uh, in the early 2000s, that those days actually long gone. Um, I think it is more challenging to grow a portfolio now, but I still think we'll see that small, uh, decent, work, hardworking person that wants a couple of buy-to-lets on the side as a pension hedge or a legacy for their children. I don't think that's going to change, but as you say, maybe Mr. Dinner Party uh, Landlord has reinvented himself. He's seeing some new angles, seeing some new ways, um, and uh, he will continue on in the sector because he's actually much, much needed. It's the small landlord with three or less properties accounts for 97% of landlords in the sector. So the portfolio landlords with three or more properties, four or more properties, uh, only account for 3%. So we do need that, that yeah. small landlord. And, and if you compare the very big landlords, Vanessa, um, if you if you look at the build to rent sector that everyone's kind of fixated on at the moment, if every home in the pipeline is built, it will still only equate to 4% of the overall housing stock. So, you know, as I remind others, we need more of everything. And, um, you know, I know that we're, we've, we've had a bit of a hard time as, as landlords over the past year. But frankly, there is no shame in being a landlord if you're doing the right sorts of things. Um, uh, you are contributing uh, to uh, very many uh, much needed uh, homes. And as long as those homes are safe, legal and secure and you conduct yourself appropriately, then you know I'm proud to be a landlord and I'm proud to represent uh, this, this sector. And frankly, I won't have anybody telling me otherwise. Here, here. Well, we've reached the end of this part of the webinar. We're just going to jump across to some uh, questions now from uh, our audience. Um, we must have sparked something, Ben, because we've had quite 15 a few questions. We've, we've touched a few nerves somewhere, I think, or sparked yeah. something. So I'd like to invite Maria uh, back in the event organizer and host. Uh, if she would just like to quickly run through two or three questions, we'll be closing this out in five minutes. Uh, uh, so Vanessa, Maria, Maria's got an issue uh, joining oh, the session. So I'm going to jump in and, and let's have a uh, Let's have a look then. You can, call, yeah. you can call me Maria. It's my, my alter ego. Um, uh, one, one good uh, question in here about the abolition of Section 21, uh, whether it will affect uh, existing tenancies when it happens or just new tenancies. Now, um, that's a very good question. Um, we haven't got into that level of detail yet, but my, I would think it would be very difficult to uh, do it retrospectively. I think it would be most appropriate to have it for new tenancies that are created, new and renewed tenancies. But I'm, 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 looking across um, uh, the Welsh border to our uh, landlord friends in Wales who are going to have to be uh, adapting and converting uh, ASTs into model uh, contract uh, tenancies. Um, and, and that is effectively retrospective. So I think this will be something that's up for grabs um, uh, and something that the NRLA will certainly be resisting uh, because I, I, I think it would be um, it would be a massive pain in the ass, quite frankly, if it was retrospective. Mm. Well, Peter Rawl, thank you for your comment. Peter has just said something interesting. He said, "I have just renegotiated a rent increase mm. with my tenant of over ten years. I raise the rent every few years to keep the rent below market value. We agree he will do some extra upkeep." 
tasks and that way we both win well thank you uh, for sharing that peter that's really interesting um gary everett's uh question uh, or comment is interesting he says that he is surprised that the epc, yes. EPC changes due in 2025 are not seen as a driving force in landlords reconsidering their place in the sector um that that's a very good point gary we have numerous discussions on property tribes about landlords that are very very concerned about this who are struggling with properties below the uh required c rating uh we did discuss it on a previous webinar didn't we ben because it has been a, a trending topic for some while but um it, it's still not a hundred percent clear uh, if this legislation is is going to land in in 2025, is it? It's not. I, I think we will find this out tomorrow, Vanessa. Okay. Um, I think this will be in the levelling up paper tomorrow, um, uh, because it. I mean, I can't think of any other vehicle it could come under at the moment. Uh, it was promised before Christmas. Um, my my best guess uh, also is that it will be 2026 rather than 2025. I think that's just kind of factoring in um sort of a year's worth of faffing about uh, uh with the with the delay of announcing it so if i was a betting man i think it will be in the leveling up paper but i think gary is absolutely right for me i'm not too worried about rental reform i can deal with section 21 based on on you know uh on uh, the, uh, section eight being beefed up and uh, redress, you know, whatever. Um, uh, but for me, all my properties are, are a D as I've uh, volunteered on this uh, webinar uh, before. Uh, so I think if I was worrying about anything, I'd be worrying about uh, energy, uh, what the minimum energy efficiency standards are going to be, what the lead times are going to be, and critically what the cap is going to be. Because last uh, discussions we had, it was 10 grand. We think that's too much. Uh, I, I, I'm okay in as much as the value of my properties, um, you know, I can raise that sort of capital if I, if I needed to. But if you're, and I'm, I don't wish to, to stereotype, but if you're not in, a, uh, in, in that position, you might have a property in a different area of the country that the value is 80 grand. Well, you know, that, that's, that's quite a lot of money to raise. And the, the point that I raised at the select committee yesterday was um, landlords are not property tycoons. Uh, the average net income uh, for a landlord is four and a half grand. So are you seriously expecting your two years worth of salary to be effectively foregone to meet the energy uh, standards? So I, I think government needs to be smarter about this. Um, I, I don't hold much hope that they, they will be. I think Gary's absolutely right. I think this is the, um, you know, this is the train coming down the track um, and I can kind of smell the smoke now. Uh, it, it's getting very, very close. Right. <laughs> well, Patricia Simmons uh, on, on this note has commented, sadly, I keep quiet about being a landlord as often we are seen as money grabbers providing poor housing. When mm. I owned a nursing home, I had the same issue, even though I believe I provide good service and my customers are generally happy with my service. Um, yes, it, it is interesting how, how landlords are perceived, private landlords are perceived, but also Ben, social landlords, mm, they've got a few things to answer to as well. And I don't think they get a, a, enough kind of attention. Uh, you, I have seen some articles about, you know, mold and condensation and rat infestations and things, but also we've had this recent case with um, an inter institutional student landlord being sued by his young uh, yes. tenant, <laughs> Jack, I think his name was, um, because he arrived at his student uh, apartment and it was not uh, as advertised and it was basically an unfinished building site. Um, you know, but all kind of landlords get all sort of, you know, lumped into the same, uh, same pot, so to speak. Um, you know, social landlords, they need to adhere to certain standards, but they don't seem to be held to account well, for that. And, and social landlords actually have higher standards that, that to which they need to comply. But as I was reminded at the select committee yesterday, the, the private rented sector, whether we like it or not, and, and these are the, the, the independent figures from the National Audit Office, is the, the least safe uh, and the least secure of all of the tenures. Now, it's, it's within our gift 
to change that. And as I reminded uh, the committee, we have very high satisfaction in the sector, 83% satisfaction, um, uh, but there's still work to do. You know, there's still homes without uh, uh, smoke alarms. There's still homes, uh, you know, without a gas check. There's still homes that, that, that tenants are having to fight for, 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 you know, the basic right of getting their deposit protected and those types of things. So, you know, I, I think we've come on a huge way uh, in, in the past 10 years, the figures bear that out. But what we're going to see over the next few weeks is how we're, you know, how the sector is going to have to change a little bit faster and harder. And I include the social sector in that as well. OK, well, on that note, uh, we're going to have to close out this webinar. Ben um, has got some other commitments this afternoon, so he's got to jump off. But we'd just like to thank every single person for joining us on this uh, February edition of The Landlord Lens. Um, it's very interesting times ahead in 2022, Ben. I, I, you know what? I just can't call it. Well, I, I, I've given up calling it. I, what I know is that, you know, there will be challenge and uh, opportunity in equal measure. And one thing I know about our audience is that we are a resilient bunch. Yeah, you know, we may we may whinge a bit and, and not like some of the things that are coming our way, but we will adapt and we will get on with them. And I think with the support of property tribes and the NRLA, we will make it uh, uh, something that is still worth doing. Mm -hmm.